Hi there, it's great to be with you. Uh, we are starting a new series today on the Psalms. Uh, and today, if you've got a Bible, if you want to turn to Psalm 139, Psalm 139. We, this was not in our plan. Uh, this was not what we were hoping to do. Like most of what has happened in the last few weeks, this is not what we thought was going to happen. But we wanted to respond to what's happening in our world and in our nation and to the unique challenges, and I think in some ways the unique opportunities perhaps as well, that this moment in history presents for us. And for thousands of years, Jews and Christians have turned to the Psalms in times of confusion and upheaval and distress and crisis, and sometimes even despair, and they found comfort here. The Psalms are songs for all seasons. There's songs which seem to work almost no matter where you are in life. There will be a song in the Psalter that resonates with your experience. So if you want to celebrate, you know, I'm just got engaged or I just got promoted or I just want to have a, I've just had a new grandchild. I want to celebrate. The Psalms are filled with joyous, riotous, noisy, clashing of cymbals and music and dancing and celebration. And if you are struck by tragedy so grave that you can't even put it into words, there is no book in scripture that will express what you feel better than this one. And in particular, what we're going to do over the next few weeks is we're going to look at what we might call some of the classics. You know, some of the really well-known, much-loved psalms, because it turns out they're really much-loved and well-known for a reason. And they're the psalms that if you turn anywhere, you're going to turn to one of these few psalms for comfort and inspiration and strength and they're often the psalms that we memorize and the ones that we spend a lot of time drawing nourishment out of, meditating on, filling our hearts with. And today we're going to look at a very famous psalm that speaks probably more than any other to one of the most unexpected challenges we're facing at the moment, and that is loneliness. The challenge of loneliness. I say unexpected because... I did not see that coming as a result of no matter almost what would strike us in these days. I did not realize how much of an issue the, the, the sense of being isolated from other people would become. We live surrounded by people in a very densely populated nation, in a large church, in a world that is more connected to other people than ever before. A lot of the time I feel like I'm trying to get rid of people. I preached a message a few weeks back about solitude and the need to get away from people. And here I am talking about the flip side, which is the danger of loneliness. And for many of us, the isolation of this season has brought us to a place of loneliness that we have never experienced before. For others of us, it has brought the pain of isolation in an intensified fashion like we've never felt it before. We might say, I, I feel lonely a lot, but this has made it a lot worse because I just can't see people, I can't touch people, I can't physically engage with people. And we might be texting and WhatsApping and Zooming away, but what do we always end up saying? It's not the same. And it isn't. We're not, it's not supposed to be the same in a way. We're, we are embodied creatures. We are very physical beings. And physical presence matters a great deal to us. In some ways, there'd be something quite disturbing if something like this was happening and we couldn't see anybody and we didn't feel anything was missing. But the loss of physical presence is painful to us. In a lot of prison systems, solitary confinement has been used as a punishment. For people who've done things that are more wrong than normal, they say, well, you've got to stay on your own. And that is now, in some measure, what's happening to all of us. So when we're faced with a, a, a big threat of loneliness like that in the nation, what do we do? We turn in desperation to the God who is ever-present wherever we are. We turn to Yahweh Shammah, the Lord who is there. Let's read Psalm 139. Beginning at verse 1. To the choir master, a psalm of David. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's high. I cannot attain it. 
Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there, your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame wasn't hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book was written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake and I'm still with you. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. O men of blood, depart from me. They speak against you with malicious intent. Your enemies take your name in vain. Don't I hate those who hate you, O Lord? Don't I loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with complete hatred. I count them my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there is any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. This is the word of God. This song comes in four stanzas or like blocks blocks of verses. And each of those four stanzas has a source of comfort for us in a time like this. I mean, you might be floundering in this season. You might be alone or bored or anxious or unwell or stir crazy or cooped up with kids. You might be experiencing a sudden loss of control. As I certainly am, you know, that's, I'm used to having a fair degree of control over what happens in my day. I've lost most of that. And if any of those things are true of you, you can take comfort in this psalm. And you can take comfort in the first stanza, you take comfort from the knowledge of God, the knowledge of God. Look at verses one and two. Oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down, when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar. And as human beings, we crave being known. We long not just to know others, but to be known by others, right? We want to be understood. We want to be related to. We want other people to know and get us. We don't just want to get them. Friendships work or don't on the basis of whether or not someone gets you, don't they? You know that experience of like, I, I'm, I sort of, uh, many of you will have had the experience of a conversation with me in which I just sort of breeze in and I'm a bit over familiar sometimes and a bit over loud and I sometimes put my foot in it and usually it can't, you kind of get away with it and people are very gracious about it and occasionally you have a conversation with someone and it quite quickly becomes apparent this person does not get me at all and this is now very awkward. I've made a real mess of things here and you, you feel really embarrassed and you back out and you're like, oh, what happened there? And my wife is sort of looking at me just going, oh, not again, he's done it. Because you, there's something quite painful and uncomfortable about not being known, about not having somebody get you or understand you. And so one of the things that makes relationships very painful is the feeling that somebody else doesn't know you, doesn't really get you, doesn't really understand you. Teenagers say it to parents, you'll never understand me. And married couples in tough times will say it as well. You, just, you don't know me at all. And that can reflect a very deep-seated kind of pain where people feel what I'm missing from you in this relationship is that I don't think you know me. Now, some of us are finding that particularly hard at the moment. We are, by being stuck with our families, are finding it difficult because we're actually in very close proximity for far more of the day than we're used to with people who are very close to us, but we are feeling like they don't really get us, some of us. 
So that might be your experience. You feel like, I'm actually feeling lonely even though I'm surrounded by people because I don't feel like these people know me as well as I'd hope. Others of us have got a very different challenge. We, however imperfect, we would love to have a family in our home at the moment, but we don't. We're, it is the little more literal sense of being alone and we're finding that extremely painful. The idea that actually plenty of people around are going through isolation with a number of other people in their household, but you may not be. And you may be experiencing loneliness in the literal sense of saying, there is nobody physically in my home. And the only chance I get to see people, if I do at all, is when I leave the house and just see people a few yards away on the street. But all of us actually want to be known. And we find it painful when that's taken away from us. As the great philosopher Sir Cliff Richard put it, I want to be known better than I know myself. That's what I'm looking for. I want somebody to love me and I want that person to love me with a knowledge that's better than I know myself. And in reality, other people will never do that. Right? People say it in romantic songs and it's kind of sweet and you get it in the movies, but it's never true. I, I think my wife and I have a good marriage, good relationship, great friendship, but it's not true that I know her better than she knows herself. It's not true that she knows me like that. Ultimately, human beings can't deliver that kind of knowledge. There are always things that I've experienced or been through that the other person can't access. Some of them when I was very young, some of them that are hard to explain. What I need is somebody who actually does know me better than I know myself and somebody who has searched me and known me and knows everything about me and still accepts me. And if I'm looking for that from a spouse or a partner or a friend or a parent or a child, I am setting myself up for a fall in that relationship. In the best marriages, actually, what people do is they recognize that they want to understand the other person as well as they can, but they recognize that if they are looking for someone to fully know them all the time and, and be totally unconditional in their love, that they're not going to find that from the other person. They're going to find that only in God. And similarly, the most fulfilled single people, the most fulfilled bereaved people or divorced people, are the people who understand what the psalmist knew, which is that although being known by people is great and is a lovely gift, there is only one who knows you fully as you are. God knows you completely. He knows right now whether you're sitting or standing. He knows whether you're sitting on your sofa watching this. I don't know that, but he does. I don't know whether you've got up and you've just taken the, you know, the, the, the device with you into the kitchen and make yourself a cup of tea while you're listening. I, he knows. He knows whether you're standing up or sitting down or kneeling or dancing or whatever you're doing right now. Even before a word is on my tongue, oh Lord, you know it completely. You do know me better than I know myself because I didn't even know I was going to say that, but you already knew. You have searched me and known me and there is such comfort in knowing that even in the midst of grave loneliness in the circumstances, that I am fully known by a God who loves me everlastingly, that God is never going to stare at you blankly making that kind of, what on earth were you thinking face? He might think you've sinned, he might want to correct you and discipline you, but he is never going to look at you and go, what? I don't understand. He will always understand. He knows. Even if he doesn't agree with what you've done, he knows what, that you were going to do it before you did it and he knew you were going to think it before you said it. And David finds such comfort in that, such solace in being known like that. God's knowledge makes him secure. He says, you hem me in behind and before and lay your hand on me. And it makes him wonder. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. And we can take comfort in the knowledge of God. Secondly, in the second stanza, verses 7 to 12, we can take comfort from the ever-presence of God. The omnipresence, we sometimes say. The, the fact that God is everywhere. The everywhereness of God. And this is probably the most famous section of the psalm. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in shale, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning and I dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. God is everywhere. God, God is omnipresent. God is inescapable. You can't get away from his presence even if you try. And let's be honest, sometimes we've tried. Right? You can ask Adam and Eve. 
You can ask Jonah. You can ask the prodigal son. People who try and escape the presence of God, it never works. He is everywhere. And although that can be challenging and convicting at times, it's also such deep reassurance for us in a moment like this. It is such comfort to know that no matter how lonely or physically isolated I may be from human beings, that there is one who is always, always with me, no matter how dark it is and no matter how far away from others I feel. This hit me powerfully. Uh, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, I was, maybe longer, I was uh, in the French mountains doing some writing. It was the first time I'd ever gone away to write, I think. And I'd gone um, to some friends of mine, had a house in the, in the mountains in the Massive Central, and I'd gone there to write. And I didn't have any idea how snowy and cold it was going to be. And I had to, and it's right up in the, in the mountains. So I kind of parked the car as far up the road as I could get. And then I had to walk up the rest of the mountain to the house um, because the snow was just blocking the road. I couldn't get anywhere. And I was basically snowed in for three or four days while I was there. And there was nobody I knew anywhere. No one who spoke English within miles of me. It's a very remote area. Uh, it was before iPhones and Facebook and all that. I'm just, I'm just stranded in the French mountains. And even the people who are nearby me in some way don't speak the same language as me. And in physical terms, it was about as isolated as I've, probably as isolated as I've ever been. And the, light, the thought came to me while I was there and I found it so powerful and liberating. A message I'd heard years before from an American preacher who was speaking about the, the Lord who is there. And he said, and it came to me while I was in this house in the French mountains. He said, the, the minimum number of people who can ever be in a room where you are is four. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Andrew. You are never alone you can understandably you feel lonely you can feel disconnected you can feel like you crave human contact at a time like this but you are never alone and you know eight different times in the bible god reveals a what we call a compound name a jehovah something or yahweh something and one of those eight names the last one actually is yahweh shama which means the lord is there and you say where where is the, what do you mean the lord's there where and he says there where you are, with you right now, high, low, east, west, dark, light, doesn't matter. Wherever you are, he's there. Not even darkness itself can keep us from his presence. Even the darkness, verse 12, is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. Wherever I go, you are there, up there, and you're still there. Run away to the farthest parts of the sea, and still you're there, staying at home without being able to see another human person come within a few meters of me, you are there. The Lord is there. Thirdly, we can take comfort from the creation of God. Right? You can take comfort from the knowledge of God, the ever-presence of God, and the creation of God. Verse 13, For you formed my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb, and I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. God is ever present because he is the creator, right? I can't get away from you, up, down, east, west, light, dark, because you formed me inside my mother. That's the link he's making with the word for in verse 13. Hiding, me hiding from God is like Hamlet trying to hide from Shakespeare. It's just ridiculous. You can't do that. That's not the way it works. He is the creator and there's nowhere you can go to escape him. Your very existence is as a result of his creative work. And God's knowledge comes because he's the creator as well. Verse 16, your eyes saw my unformed substance and in your book was written every single one of my days when as yet there was none of them. That's beautiful poetry and Christians often quote it, and I think rightly, to explain why we are pro-life, why we believe that unborn people are created in the image of God just like the rest of us. But its main purpose here is to bring comfort to believers. It's to say God formed you. He knitted you. He made you fearfully and wonderfully inside your mother. He wove you. He wrote all of your days in his book. You are wonderfully made. Like all of his works. You are precious, like all of his thoughts. And his thoughts, verse 18, are innumerably vast. If you could count them, it would be like the sand of the seashore. 
And yet even when having gone to sleep and kind of dozed off and forgotten about him, we then wake up in the morning, he's still there. He is always with you because he is your creator. How could you possibly hide from or disappear from his presence? So this psalm is overflowing with comfort for the lonely, the isolated, or the anxious believer. And then in the last stanza, the last block of six verses, it seems to take a slightly strange turn. The psalmist starts talking about the judgment of God. Verse 19, Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. O men of blood, depart from me. Verse 21, Don't I hate those who hate you, O Lord? Verse 22, I hate them with a complete hatred. I count them my enemies. That doesn't sound very comforting, right? I think, what a weird ending to an otherwise lovely psalm. Aren't we supposed to love our enemies? What's going on here? By the way, the answer is yes, we are supposed to love our enemies. But we might then ask, why is this in the psalm? And how on earth is it comforting? Well, the reason it's here comes in the final two verses of the psalm. Verses 23 and 24. Search me, O God. And know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there's any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. So the psalmist is saying, given that you are the creator of the world and that you know everything and that you are everywhere, there's no point in me trying to hide my sin from you. That's just stupid. So I'm going to ask you to look at my life and see if there's any sin in it, anything grievous in it. Lord, do I join forces with the wicked? Do I hang out with violent, bloodthirsty people? Do I celebrate evil and blasphemy? No, I don't do that. I condemn wickedness and I avoid participating in it as well. And I'm asking you to judge it. So hopefully, Lord, you can see that by my decision to distance myself from and despise evil, I'm actually living a righteous life. So when you look into my soul, you won't find sin there. The psalm isn't, do you see, the, the psalm isn't just calling for God to judge others. He's actually asking God to judge him. He's saying, look in my life and see if there's anything wrong. If I have, instead of despising evil, have ended up making peace with it. It's like an expectation of opening ourselves up to the divine surgeon, asking him to do open the heart surgery on us and remove anything that might be grievous from our lives. And we know that it might be painful, but we also know that he will be good. And so we say with Abraham, Lord, I'm going to trust that the judge of all the earth will do what's right. Look in my life and take out anything that shouldn't be there. Now, even so, you might find the psalmist's confidence here. Look in my life, you won't find any evil. You might think, that's kind of troubling. Can we really appeal to God like that? Can we really be certain that he won't find anything grievous in our hearts? And that's when we then see the significance of the opening words of the psalm at the very top, where it says, of David. Of David. This is a David psalm. This is a messianic psalm. That is, it's a song ultimately that applies to the Christ, to the Lord Jesus. It's a psalm of David, and the only person who could truly pray it blamelessly was the Lord Jesus. And he alone can say all of these things without any qualification. He alone, I can pray sometimes and say, Lord, look at my heart and see if there's anything evil there. But I know we'll probably find something. The Lord Jesus alone could say, look in my heart and you will never find any compromise with sin or evil. And he could pray knowing that his heart had never harbored evil and his thoughts had never entertained any sin. Yet he, the Lord Jesus, in spite of that moral perfection, instead of slaying the wicked, was slain by the wicked. Instead of departing from men of blood and saying, get them away from me, he actually died for men of blood. Instead of hating his enemies, like this says, he loved them, even us, to the bitter end. So if you worry, and you may do, that an ever-present, all-knowing creator God might be scary and that he might find a few grievous ways in your soul, the comfort you have is that he already has. In fact, he's found so many grievous ways in my soul that he sent his son Jesus to die for them. Jesus has paid for them all. And my hope is not that somehow when God looks at me, he'll find nothing but good decisions and good behavior. My hope is that God has found so many bad decisions that he has come in person to die on the cross to rescue me from them. And that's where my comfort comes from when God looks into my soul. 
I don't expect him to look there and say, wow, that Andrew, he's just nailed every decision he's made. I expect him to look into my life and say, wow, that Andrew, I am so glad that I came to rescue him from his sin because if I hadn't, there would be no hope. But because I have, he is righteous in Christ. So if you're lonely or anxious or confused or struggling with people in your household or simply frustrated, there is comfort in this psalm. Comfort that comes from the ever-present God. If you are isolated and you want to be known, come to the God who knows you completely. If you're lonely and you want to experience presence, come to the God who is always there. If you're confused and uncertain about the future, come to the creator who wrote all of your days in his book before any of them came to be. And if the last few weeks have made you more aware of your sin, and they have for me, come to the judge of the earth who does always what is right and who took on flesh that the judgment of God might land on him instead of on you. Let's pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen.